Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Today we will arrive at the terminus of this course. We will discuss the stability of a reactor with both fuel and moderator temperature feedback effects. The derivations in today's material will get a little messy, so at several points we'll jump to the solution rather than solving these equations explicitly. Solving these equations is, of course, an excellent exercise for you to do on your own. Recall that the internal reactivity in a system, which is again the reactivity that is induced from feedback, is equal to the sum of the reactivity from fuel feedback and the sum of the reactivity from moderator feedback. By recalling the definition of the reactivity feedback coefficient, alpha, we can recast this expression such that the internal reactivity is equal to the sum of the fuel reactivity coefficient times the fuel temperature change plus the moderator reactivity coefficient times the moderator temperature change. Our goal is to develop an expression for these temperature changes in the fuel and moderator, and thus an expression for the internal reactivity contributions. And to do this, we must solve a set of simultaneous differential equations for the fuel and moderator temperature changes. The temperature change in the moderator follows the same expression that we introduced in the last class, is equal to a positive component describing the heat transfer from the fuel into the moderator, with this time coefficient lag sigma fm, minus a component describing the effect of recirculating the coolant, which has a lag time constant described by sigma r. The rate of change of the fuel temperature is equal to some constant, a double prime, times the delta power term, which implies that we assume that all power changes contribute directly to the fuel temperature change, divided by the specific heat of the fuel, c sub f, all minus the heat transfer term describing the flow of heat from the fuel into the moderator. This fuel to moderator heat transfer term appears in both equations but has opposite signs. It appears in the first equation with a negative sign because heat flows out of the fuel, and it appears in the second equation for the moderator with a positive sign because this heat flows from the fuel into the moderator. For simplicity, we'll now define some gamma and kappa, where gamma equals 1 divided by sigma fm and kappa equals 1 divided by sigma r. After taking the Laplace transform of both equations and subjecting ourselves to a fair bit of algebra, we arrive at this expression for the reactor feedback control element, H of S. These equations tend to lead us into an algebraic death spiral, so we'll define several constants to simplify our expressions for H of S and G of S, which is again the reactivity forward transfer function. These constants include T1, T2, T3, T4, and T5, and also a k naught and a k sub t. What happens to our feedback control element if our coolant is not circulating? In other words, what happens if we have stationary coolant? In this case, our recirculation time constant approaches infinity, since the coolant will never recirculate, which means that kappa approaches zero. If we allow kappa to approach zero in our previous expression, then it will simplify to this expression for h of s. Let's consider another special case. What happens if we have no fuel feedback? In this case, the fuel temperature reactivity coefficient approaches zero, which gives us this expression for h of s. Notice that this expression for h of s is actually different compared to our expression for h of s from the previous lecture with only single temperature feedback. Why are these two expressions different? After all, each system assumed that alpha fuel was equal to zero. These terms are different because even though we've assumed that alpha fuel equals zero, our fuel temperature is no longer directly proportional to the power. Yes, it depends on the power, but its differential equation now also contains this term describing heat flow out of the fuel into the moderator. This means that the fuel temperature is no longer proportional to the reactor's power, and it leaves us with the possibility that the fuel temperature could migrate out of phase with the reactor's power. If we last assume that our system has no fuel feedback and that the coolant is stationary, then this expression will describe our feedback transfer function. Why are we discussing these special cases? Mostly for convenience. Your homeworks may include analyses of systems with stationary coolant and or with no fuel feedback. Presenting these expressions now will make it easier for you to analyze a reactor's stability under these special cases. 
So now that we've developed an expression for our reactor's feedback transfer function with dual temperature feedback, let's make our way to the final summit of this course, analyzing the stability of a reactor with dual temperature feedback. If we analyze the control block diagram for the system and develop an expression for its transfer function, then we'll find that our system's characteristic equation equals this fourth order polynomial of S, where our polynomial's coefficients are this complicated combination of our T, K0, and K sub T terms. K0, T1, T2, T3, and T4 are always positive, which means that some of the terms in this characteristic equation will always be positive. However, the sign of kt and t5 depends on alpha f and alpha m. We'll analyze the stability of our characteristic equation using the Roth criterion. And after some algebraic adventures, we arrive at this Roth matrix. Again, our system will be stable if the left-hand side terms in the Roth matrix are all positive. In this left-hand side column, we have these B and C terms, where B is given by this expression, and C is given by this even more complicated expression. So will these terms be positive? Well, let's consider four possible cases. Either alpha F is positive or it's negative, and then either alpha M is positive or it's negative. We'll skip case one for the time being. Honestly, it's the most interesting case of them all, so let's save it for last. In case 2, both alpha m and alpha f are positive, meaning that we have entirely positive feedback coefficients from the fuel and from the moderator. You can probably guess that this case will result in unstable behavior, but let's also prove it algebraically. The kt term is equal to this combination of alpha sub fuel and the alpha submoderator coefficients, which all appear exclusively in kt's numerator. Most of the other terms in this expression are time constants, which means that they can only be positive. And it turns out that if alpha f and alpha m are positive, then kt must also be positive. This is problematic because our Roth matrix's left-hand side column contains this negative k0 kt divided by t2, t3, t4 term, where k0 T2, T3, and T4 are all positive. So if KT is also positive, then this term is negative, which means that our system will be unstable. In case 3, we have positive moderator feedback, but negative fuel feedback. Just as with case 2, our system will be unstable if KT becomes positive, which may happen depending on the magnitude of alpha F and alpha M. If gamma plus kappa times the absolute value of alpha f is greater than gamma times alpha m, then kt will become negative and our system will become unstable. If we happen to have stationary coolant, then kappa equals zero and our system will become unstable if the magnitude of the fuel reactivity coefficient is greater than the magnitude of the moderator reactivity coefficient. This interpretation comes with a caveat that our two complicated b and c terms must also be positive. We'll delay talking about B and C until we discuss case 1. For case 4, we see negative moderator feedback and positive fuel feedback, and we run into the same stability condition as for case 3. KT must be negative. To satisfy this condition, our requirements from case 3 are essentially flipped. Alpha F times gamma plus kappa must be less than gamma times the absolute value of alpha M. If our coolant is stationary, then alpha f must be less than the magnitude of alpha m. Again, b and c must also be positive, which is a scenario that we will discuss now. In case 1, both of our temperature reactivity coefficients are negative, which means that kt will be negative regardless of the magnitude of our reactivity coefficients. So what about b and c? Before we examine b and c, we'll simplify things using some generally reliable assumptions. In general, T2 is much less than T4, T1 is much greater than T5, T3 is much less than T4, and K0 times the absolute value of KT times T1 is much greater than 1. For C to be positive, B must always be positive. And for B to be positive, in general, 1 divided by T3 plus 1 divided by T2 
must be greater than this expression, which is again a function of alpha f and alpha m. This expression tells us that our system can become unstable if alpha m and alpha f are too large, even if they are negative. So now that we've proven that having reactivity coefficients that are too large and negative can actually make our system unstable, what is the physical interpretation for this behavior? Well, if we plot delta rho in for the fuel and moderator as a function of some external reactivity oscillation, then we can see why our system can become unstable in these circumstances. Here the fuel reactivity is directly opposed to the external reactivity, but the moderator feedback which includes this delay term, both because of the time it takes for the heat to flow out of the fuel and into the moderator, and because of the time it takes for the coolant to recirculate, ends up being delayed so much that the moderator feedback is perfectly opposed to the fuel feedback. Thus, the fuel and moderator feedback interfere destructively, resulting in a small but unabated positive net reactivity. Thus, too much negative reactivity can paradoxically cause our system to become unstable. If we plot our reactor stability in several different regimes as a function of alpha f and alpha m, we can visualize the results of cases 1 through 4. Our reactor is always unstable if alpha f and alpha m are positive, and it may be stable if our coefficients are negative, but this depends on their magnitude. This concludes our lectures for this course. Looking back, we have come a long way from where we started. In the kinetics portion of the course, we discussed adjoints, developed the perturbation equations, we used these two concepts to develop the point reactor equation, we discussed a multitude of approximations to solve this point reactor kinetics equation, and then in the dynamics portion, we discussed Laplace transforms, control block diagrams, a multitude of stability analysis methods, a reactor transfer function, and lastly, we explored how a reactor behaves with fuel and moderator feedback. I hope that you enjoyed this course, and that you found these lectures to be informative, and that you didn't think that my bad jokes were all that bad. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you tune in for future lectures on this channel.